Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Thank you for traveling and for taking of your day, your time to be here and to uh, share in this experience. Looking forward to it. I am Darius Gray. I'll be your first presenter and I am working with Brother Marvin Perkins and he will be your second presenter. Our first presentation is one that I'm quite fond of. It's called Blacks in the Bible. The five books shown here are part of the source materials that I used to do the research. But I want to point out that while these books were used, what we're going to be talking about is found in the standard King James Version of the Bible. No smoke and mirrors, we're just taking it from the standard Bible. So if you have questions and you want to review it later, that's where the information can be found. The book on the top left and on the top right are ones that I would highly recommend. They're very good reads. The two on the bottom left and the bottom right are more scholarly. Uh, good information, a little bit harder to sort through, but it's worth reading. The one in the middle is sort of less challenging. There are a lot of pictures there and it would make one believe that the entire biblical world was black, but it's another one that could be a, a source document. But again, I recommend the two on the top first and the two on the bottom left and right second. Why this presentation? Really, I'm a genealogist, an amateur genealogist, and I've been challenged by my faith to do my family history, my genealogy. And in a sense, that's what we're doing here. It helps to develop a sense of self, whether we're doing genealogy for our own families or as we're doing, in this case, blacks in the Bible. And like others, we need to be able to see ourselves and our nations in the scriptures. And this also helps to repudiate the confusion about race as presented by most Christian churches. So often the depictions that we see in, in Bible publications or biblical publications, scriptural publications, indicate whites. And you see a white person in this situation, that situation, and you very seldom see people of color. And at times it has caused blacks to feel that there is no place for them in the Bible. And as we will see, such is not the case. What do we mean by black? Here we have a picture of the African continent, 11,635,000 square miles. It is huge. For those of you who have had the pleasure of traveling there, you know that. It's as far from one end of Africa to the other as it is from Boston, Massachusetts to Buenos Aires, Argentina. A huge distance. In that distance, we have people of every shape, color, variety, body size, and style. You have the world's tallest people, the Watusi, uh, with men often exceeding seven feet. You have the world's shortest people, the pygmy. You have blue-black people in Sudan and Ethiopia, the Nubians. You have chocolate brown in West Africa. You have pecan color in Ethiopia. So when we're talking about black, we're talking about any of those variations, any of those colors and body sizes. In this nation, there used to be a rule called the one drop rule. And it indicated that a person uh, only required one drop of black blood to be considered black. Well, I think we're going to go a few more than one drop when we do this research. But uh, again, we're, we're looking broadly when we speak of black. In the beginning, I uh, wish I had a film that could do beautiful pictures and show the creation of the universe, but this is as good as it gets. This is courtesy of NASA. This is a star cluster where stars are being born. I just love that photo. As we do our genealogy, we're going to do the who, when, and where. Chronological table has the year 3761 BC, according to Jewish tradition, the day that Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden. Between 3740 BC and 2500 BC, we have Cain, Abel, and Seth being born to their parents, Adam and Eve. I think we all know these biblical stories. We know that Cain kills Abel and is exiled to wander in the eastern land of Nod. As we move forward in time, 3740 BC and 2500 BC, we have the flood that destroys Eden and all of the ancient ones. Noah and his three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem, repopulate the earth after the flood. 
Now this is where we're really going to start. So this is where the information really starts to get pertinent. Again, on that boat, we had four families. We had Noah, Mrs. Noah, the three sons, and their three wives. And all of the Earth's population came from those three sons. It is generally accepted that Ham is the father of the black race. And that is what we're going to follow in this presentation. If Ham is the father of the black race, we're doing reverse genealogy. We're not starting with ourselves, as is normally the case, and working back. We're starting with our earliest known ancestor and working forward. So with Ham as the father of the black race, these are his four sons, as indicated in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20. Now that's going to be the key to what we're doing today. You need to know the code words. The Bible does not deal with people by race. It does not say this person was black or Hispanic or Asian or European. It talks about their family linkage, and it talks about the places where they lived. So we need to know the families, and we need to know their place of habitation. So with these four sons of Ham, the father of the black race, we have Mizram, who settled in Egypt, Cush, who settled in Sudan and Ethiopia, Put, and sometimes you'll see that spelled with a P-H-U-T, settled in Libya in North Africa, and Canaan, who settled the land of Palestine, the, the land we know today as Israel. Again, here's our key. Just like on a map you have a key, this will be your key. Now, these are those who descended directly from Ham. And what we need to do, realizing that this is our key, Whenever we see one of these names, we need to think black. When you see the name Ham, think black, or Cush, Mizram, Put, Canaan, black. And that will help you to identify the people in the Bible who are of this family line. Now, Nimrod, Genesis chapter 10, verse 9. And Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord, where it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. Did you know that Nimrod was a descendant of Ham and therefore would be one of our black family members? The Tower of Babel. Where was it? Here's the tower here. What is that land now? Where, where is that? Saudi Arabia would be here. I think we're looking at southern Iraq today. And of course there's Israel, Canaan, Egypt. Put would be about here. Now to start learning the names, I'll drop down to the last one, chapter 10, verse 13. And Mizram begat Ludim, and Anamim, and Lahabim, and Neftuim. At first, when you read the names, you, you see them as being foreign, something different. They don't roll off your tongue easily. But if you read and practice them, they will roll off. And then if you recognize each time you see one of those names, think black. That's a brother. That's a sister. And Canaan, going down to the second one, and Canaan begat Sidon, and that's spelled with an S, but sometimes you will see that in the scriptures with a Z his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Gergesites. Pay special attention to the Gergesite because we're going to follow that line here shortly. Ham's descendants continued, and the Hivites, and the Archites, and the Sinites, and the Arvidites, the Zemurites, Hamathites, and the Canaanites. And just to make sure that we understand that this is Ham's family tree, God has provided in His Scriptures down in verse 20, the last of the verses here, these are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. So everyone got the key? Every time we see one of those names, we're going to think? Thank you. Mizram put Philistines, Canaan, Amorites. Now I need to tell you there are two groups of Hittites. There is a Semitic group of Hittites in the north, but there is a part of that family that is here further south. Bible history timeline, just as doing genealogy has a timeline. Around 2100 B.C., Father Abraham lived in Ur, and God instructed him to leave, and he went north into Haran, and then came down here through what is Canaan, 
into Egypt, and then back into Canaan. And again, the citation is Genesis chapter 12. So who did Abraham meet? Here are the neighbors. And I, I think it's telling. We see a Syrian, a Nubian, a Libyan, an Egyptian. Very few of them look to be fair-skinned and blonde-haired. And yet these were the people that would have been there around that time. Others in the hood. And again, the features are distinctly those of black Africans. And from the tomb of Ramses III, again, we have a Libyan, a Nubian, Syrian, a Bedouin, and a Hittite. Now, for the sake of clarity, I want it to be clearly stated that we're not going to be saying that every person in the Bible is black, but yet we are going to see those who are direct descendants from Ham. We're just going to be doing a partial examination, but this isn't about everyone there being black, just as it would be incorrect to have everyone portrayed as European. Once in Canaan, Melchizedek meets Abraham. The story that Abraham gave a tenth of his monies to Melchizedek. Who is this Melchizedek? As a king and high priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek holds a place of great honor and respect. What are his other titles? This man to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. He is also known as the King of Salem. Anyone know where Salem is? Sir? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Right answer. Where was Salem? What did Melchizedek look like? Well, for a clue, we can go back to Genesis chapter 10, verse 16. Remember when I pointed out the Jebusites? He was Canaan's third son, one of Ham's grandsons. So Ham is the father of the black race. Jebus was a grandson of Ham. The holy city of God going to the scriptures. Judges chapter 19, verse 10. But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled. His concubine also was with him. And then as we drop down to the next verse, we had it confirmed again by Jebus. And down on the last line, and in the, this city of the Jebusites, and lodged in it. And then the last verse, And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were the inhabitants of the land. Now the first two citations are in Judges. The last one is in Chronicles. And it's speaking not of Abraham's time, but of the time of King David. There is approximately a thousand year time span there that has just been covered. The Jebusites were the original inhabitants of the area. They were the first builders of the city of Jerusalem, Salem. It was a fortress city. It was on a, a rocky outcrop, and it could not be easily attacked. And the Jebusites were able to stay in control of that area for a thousand years. It wasn't until the time of King David that they were finally routed. So during the time of Father Abraham, the Jebusites would have been in control of the area. So what did Melchizedek look like? This is a picture I found on the internet. And it might be true, but I am not sure that this is an accurate depiction of Melchizedek. Now, I also want to pause and say, am I saying then that Melchizedek was black? No, but I am saying he was hanging with the brothers because he was in that city that was a black city. We have Abraham and Sarah. The story, Sarah is barren, and she gives her Egyptian. Now, when we see Egyptian, what do we think? Black. Handmaiden, Hagar, to Abraham. And we have the beginnings of two nations. Abraham fathers Ishmael by Hagar, the Egyptian handmaiden, and Isaac by Sarah, his wife. We have the expulsion of Hagar. Sarah and Hagar d decided to have a little competition. It, it appears from the scripture that Hagar was sort of lording it over Sarah, that she could have a child when Sarah could not, and that even when Sarah had a child, 
that Hagar's child was the firstborn, and so it caused dissension in the family. And Hagar and her son Ishmael were sent away, but the scripture also points out that out of them came a great nation. Uh, father saw to it that they were not left alone. But if we take Isaac, the second son of Abraham, Abraham fathers twins, Esau and Jacob, and we have a struggle for birthrights. Isaac, the father, in his old age, is tricked into blessing Jacob, the second son, and not Esau, the first son. But if we look at Esau, Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite. And we see here that he, she is a Hittite on both sides of her family. And again, when we see that in that area, that part of the world, we're thinking black. Jacob, his name is changed to Israel. He has 12 sons for whom the 12 tribes are named. Now, can anyone give me the names of those 12 tribes and in order? I've got a dollar bill here. <laughs> no one can do it? Okay, now that I'm safe, I've got a $10 bill here. <laughs> All right, let's try it. Asher, Benjamin, Dan, help me count now. Dan, Ephraim, Gad, Issachar, Judah, Levi, Naphtali, Reuben, Simeon, and Zebulon. How many? I should have given you 13. What happened? We've got an extra person there. Someone was dropped. Which of the names in that group was dropped from the 12 tribes? Reuben. Reuben. Does anyone remember why he was dropped? Reuben was the firstborn of the first wife, Leah, and yet his mother was not the favorite. Uh, and so he uh, felt that uh, his mother had been uh, lessened in prominence. And he did some things. He went into another of his father's wives, a concubine, and had knowledge of her. And as a result, he lost his birthright. So Reuben came out and is replaced by the two sons of Joseph. We have Ephraim and? Thank you. Now. In those 12 tribes, we have Judah, and Judah is considered the father of what group? The Jews. the Jews. And in Genesis chapter 38, verses 2 through 6, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in unto her. Again, we have a Canaanite here who is then the wife of Judah. Now, her name was not Shua. Shua is her father's name. Uh, her name was Bathshua. But they had three sons. The oldest was named Er. Er grows up to marry a young woman by the name of Tamar. And we find that in Genesis 38, 6. And Tamar was from Timnath in the vicinity of Adullam, a known Canaanite town. And Tamar's sister is identified as a Canaanite. Tamar gives birth to twins by Judah, her father-in-law. Now, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that biblical story, but uh, the Bible has some rather interesting twists and turns in it. The man to whom Tamar was given uh, as a wife, heir, was wicked in the sight of God, and God killed him, called him home early on his mission. It was the tradition in the country at that time that the then next oldest son, should take Tamar as his wife and should have seed through her, give her a child, which would be raised as actually the descendant of his now deceased brother. Well, the second son was not pleased with that concept. And so he saw to it that uh, his wife, um, Tamar, did not become pregnant. God was unhappy with that decision and called that young man home. So, the third son is too young to be married. And uh, so her father-in-law, Tamar's father-in-law, Judah, uh, said, go home, stay with your family until the youngest son is old enough, and then we will have you marry him. Well, time passed. Judah's wife, Bethshua, died, 
And the daughter-in-law is now thinking, well, when is my time? Because the, the, the youngest son has now grown to maturity. Uh, have I been forgotten? So she decided to play the part of the harlot. And she heard that her father-in-law was coming into the area, Timnath, and she went and dressed herself as a harlot, and was by the side of the road, and her father-in-law went in unto her and impregnated her, which is an interesting biblical story. But it's important because we're going to follow the children, or at least one of them later on. But Judah had a better known brother named Joseph, and we know the story of the coat of many colors. His brothers are jealous of him. They sell him to Midianite merchants, and then he is sold into Egypt. And again, think black. He is now among blacks. The descendants of Mizram are in Egypt. Joseph's father and brothers later leave Canaan because of famine and move to Egypt. Unbeknownst to the family, Joseph, whom they had sold into slavery, has risen to become a trusted assistant of Pharaoh, second only to Pharaoh in the land. Joseph ultimately makes himself known to his brothers who have come seeking grain. And later Joseph takes a wife. And here we have a very significant point. Genesis chapter 41 verse 45, And Pharaoh gave to him to wife a seneth, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. Now Potipharah was an Egyptian sun god priest. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of the famine came, which Aseneth, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bare unto him. It's interesting that in all of these citations they give the name of the father of Aseneth and also what he did, what his title was, what he did for a living. He was an Egyptian sun god priest. Now, many who have studied the Bible, and especially in days past when there were so many attempts made to diminish the possibility that uh, blacks could have had a part in the Scriptures, um, because the Scriptures actually were used to try and justify the enslavement of Africans. And so efforts were made to say that Seneth was not an Egyptian, but she was in fact a Hyksos person. Now, the Hyksos were shepherders who came into the area, and some say that they were Canaanites, others Amorites, but both of those groups, again, are descendants from Ham. Some say they were out of Syria, they had a nomadic lifestyle, they only ruled in Egypt for about a 200 year period of time. It was a bloodless coup. They came in, they left intact the establishments, the religions, uh, the government order in Egypt at the time, but they ruled for about 200 years. So in all likelihood, since Aseneth's father is clearly identified as a sun god priest, he was not changed, uh, the religions were not changed, we know they were not, and Aseneth herself would be a woman of color. Time passes. We have the death of Jacob. We have the death of Joseph. And we have the birth of Moses. An Egyptian holds the future. Moses found by Pharaoh's daughter. And again, when we see Egyptian, the descendants of Mizram, one of the four sons of Ham, we have a woman of color finding the future prophet. We have the Exodus after being enslaved for 400 years, led by Moses. The Jews leave Egypt and head toward the land of Canaan, which is to become Israel. They wander in the desert for 40 years. During those years, Moses marries Zipporah, the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian. Now, which wife? While Zipporah is clearly mentioned as Moses' wife, the name of the woman spoken of in Numbers 12, 1 is not given. However, God's attitude towards that woman is quite clear. And let me share that with you because it's very significant. In the lead into the chapter it says, Aaron and Miriam, that's Moses' brother and sister, complained against Moses, the most meek of all men. The Lord promises to speak to Moses mouth to mouth and to reveal to him his similitude. Miriam becomes leprous for a week. What we have here, reading the first verse, and Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. 
for he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, if you didn't get it the first time, this woman is an Ethiopian. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Has he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. They're jealous of their brother. They're jealous that the Lord speaks to him mouth to mouth. They want to have a part of the, the glory. But what they do is take it out on Moses' wife, and they speak against her because of her ethnicity, because she was an Ethiopian woman. I don't believe this to be Zipporah. I believe this to be a, another wife that Moses had. But what we do know, without having clarity on that, is how God responded. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 9, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. You know, I, I can imagine God saying to Miriam, you don't like this woman because of her color. You like white? I'm going to show you white. <laughs> Miriam apologizes to God. Uh, he allows her to stay in that leprous condition for a week and then returns her to her healthy condition. But here again is someone that is a person of color whom many of us have glossed over and not known was a woman of color. The Ethiopian wife of Moses. That same brother, Aaron, who was Moses' brother, was the first high priest of all of Israel. And we have his lineage there in the citation, Exodus 2.1. He was born during the time that Israel was in Egypt. Eighty-three years before the Exodus, three years before his brother Moses, and about ten years after his sister Miriam. Now here he is in his priestly garb. Aaron married Elisheba, who was of the tribe of Judah, as seen in these citations. They had four sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. As it was structured, that priesthood should have gone to the eldest son, Nadab. But he died, and it's an interesting story in the scriptures and one I would point you to. And Abihu also died. And so the priesthood that Aaron held fell upon his third son, Eleazar. Eleazar, the third son of Aaron, succeeds his father as high priest upon the death of his father Aaron. And there's the citation. And Eleazar took a wife of the daughters of Putiel and became, and now when we look at that name, Put, with the H, P-H-U-T, and became the father of Phineas, which name means black, the Negro, or mouth of bronze. So Phineas now, the grandson of Aaron is the high priest of Israel. He served as the high priest for 19 years, this biracial young man. Another person of color that you may not have known was there. Israel enters Canaan, the promised land. Note the city of Jericho here above the Dead Sea. Jerusalem is about in here. We have the fall of Jericho in its day. Jericho was the most important Canaanite fortress city in the Jordan Valley, stronghold. It found itself directly in the path of the advancing Israelites. And the citation, Joshua 2, 1, and they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab. Now, where is Moses at this point? Moses is dead. Who is leading the Israelites? Joshua. And Joshua is a military man, and he wants to know the lay of the land. And so before attacking this fortress city, he sent two spies in to see how much strength there was in the city, and if there were any weak spots where he um, might be more successful in attacking. Well, those two spies got discovered. The, the local police force knew they were there, and so they needed to be hidden. And they went to the house of Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. And what I find interesting about this story, Rahab is a Canaanite woman. And yet she has already been prepared by the God of the Israelites 
and she has been told that the Israelites are going to win this coming war. And so she exacts a price from the spies. She agreed to hide them on condition that when the Israelites came to power, that she and her family would be protected. They agreed to that arrangement. She hid them. The battle came, the Ark of the Covenant and the trumpets um, fell the mighty walls, and the walls came tumbling down. Everyone know the story. The uh, Israelites were instructed by God to march around the city blowing their horns once a day for six days, and on the seventh day they were to march around the city seven times, and it was on the seventh day after seven times around that the walls came tumbling down through the power of God. Now that harlot, Rahab, marries a good Jewish boy. His name is uh, Solomon, and they had a son by the name of Boaz. That son married a widow named Ruth, daughter-in-law of one Naomi. Ruth is seen here as she's often depicted. She and Naomi were without men in their lives and they needed to fend for themselves. So Ruth would go to the fields of Boaz and glean the fields, take that which was left intentionally by Jewish law for those who had not the means to purchase food themselves. So here we have Ruth gleaning the fields and there's Boaz as the owner of the field meeting this young lady. And now we have the begats. And Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab. And this is in the first scripture in the New Testament, chapter 1, verse 5. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Who did Jesse begat? David. David. Progenitor of one Jesus of Nazareth. Son of David was one of Jesus' titles. Prophets had foretold that a descendant of David would restore Israel's kingdom. So we know that he comes through this line. Now when we're looking at this in the book of Matthew, some have contended, well, this is not the uh, genealogy for you know, the real father of Jesus. This is the genealogy for Joseph whom we as Christians believe was not the literal father of Jesus. And that indeed may be the case. However, what we do know also is that Joseph and his wife Mary were cousins. And so they share the same Davidic line. So the same genealogy history that would apply to Joseph applies to Mary. So this is the genealogy of the parent Mary of Jesus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see some names here. Again, the first chapter of the New Testament, and in the third verse, and Judas, that's Judah. Remember Judah went in to have a close and personal relationship with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. Judah, of course, had married a Canaanite woman, Bethshua, who died. He had gone to the same city uh, in the area of Timnath to get Tamar to be the wife of his first son, but wound up being the father of Tamar's children. And here we have that listed. And what I find so interesting here, the Bible is really patriarchal. And generally we're talking about men and it seems to be written about men for men. But in this case, we're seeing women listed. Going on, chapter 1, verse 4. And here we have Solomon, and it is that same Solomon who later marries Rahab. He is a direct descendant of Tamar, the Canaanite woman. So this young Jewish boy that I said married Ruth, actually he was biracial himself. And Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse uh, begat David the king, and then we have Solomon, and we have Uriah, that is Uriah's, Uriah the, what's the other part of his title? The Hittite. And again, when we see Hittite, we think black. Am I saying then that the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, was black? No, I am not. 
But I am saying that in his direct lineage, following it forward in the Bible by the genealogy given in the King James Version, and if we apply that one drop rule, then by certain standards, the Savior would indeed, by certain standards, be considered black. But we know from the scriptures that he was a Jew. But isn't it fitting that he who is the only begotten of the Father, he who came here to redeem us all, regardless of race and ethnicity, from our sins, isn't it fitting and isn't it appropriate that he would have within him the genetic seed of all of us? There are countless blacks in the New Testament, including these two. Philip preaches to the Ethiopian eunuch, and there's the citation. And we have Simon the cross-bearer, the eunuch first. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, and to the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, black, and to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a, a black country in Africa, and eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasure. And they came to Jerusalem to worship. Now what I like, and the angel of the Lord spoke directly to Philip. The great care was given that this man have a chance to receive of the gospel. In Acts 8, 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot of the Ethiopian. And then finally, And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So here we are in the New Testament, not just in the Old Testament, and again we see that there are blacks in the Bible if we know the codes, if we're looking for the, the genealogies, or if we're looking at the places of habitation, the lands from which they've come. The Cyrenian, we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in each of those Gospels, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross, referring to the cross of the Savior. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. This is a man who is known in that community. They know the, the names of his children. They know from whence he's come. He is a Cyrenian. And they led him away. They laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now why are they making a point of Simon the Cyrenian carrying the cross? What's going on in uh, Israel at this time? What's going on in Jerusalem at this time? It's a holiday. What holiday is it? Passover. Passover. In Jewish tradition, you needed to be ritually clean to participate in the Passover celebration. And one of the things that you could not do is touch anything dead, unclean, or about to be dead, as in condemned to death to be crucified on the cross. So the Romans, in respect for that Jewish tradition, laid hold upon a man who was a non-Jew, Simon, a Cyrenian, who happened to be there. And him they compelled to bear the cross. Now, where is Cyrenia? Here's Egypt, there's Israel. Remember Put, one of the sons of Ham? Cyrenia is a city on the coast there, an African city, a non-Israelite compelled to bear the cross. That Simon was a Cyrenian is carefully noted by each of the three evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Father's black children have held prominent roles throughout scriptural history. Ham's probable offspring are cited in both the Old and New Testaments. And this has just been a thumbnail presentation. What you can now do as you're reading the scriptures and as you become familiar with those family names and those places of habitation, and you remember to think every time you see one of those names, that is a person of color, that is a black person. As you see those names and read them, you will find that the family of Ham is spread well out in the Bible. 
We have Pharaoh's daughter who raised Moses as her own son. We have the Canaanite wife of Judah, her father was Shua. We have Tamar who was impregnated by her father-in-law, Judah. We have Uriah the Hittite, husband of Bathsheba, loyal servant of King David. We have the Ethiopian wife of Moses, defended by God himself when Aaron and Miriam were troubled by her race. We have Asenath, wife of Joseph and the daughter of an Egyptian sun god priest. We have another Pharaoh's daughter whom Solomon took to wife. We have Sheba, the queen who undertook to prove Solomon. And we have the Zidonian, remember Zidon, Zidon with an S, the Zidonian widow who gave her last cake to Elijah the prophet. Though many Eurocentric writers have hastened to depict each of these individuals as non-black, there is very little to suggest that they are all wrongly placed in Ham's family tree. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Thank you. Now I know that was fast paced, but the principle is to learn the names and then to go forward and to do the search. Are there any questions that you have? Sir. Just a comment because I've studied this. Uh, when you mentioned biracial, Egyptian was known as a brown skin race, Negroid in their features. Mm -hmm. Ethiopians, the original Jew that I've learned, was a very sharp feature and very black skin. So when you say biracial, uh, Aaron and his sister, they were brown skinned and they were upset that he was marrying a very black skinned woman. That's just one little. And the interesting thing in that period of time, as you do read and you identify these families, you'll find that many people are biracial. There was much intermarriage uh, among the various groups there. And, and again, you have every body type depicted. Uh, when I was in Ethiopia, uh, I saw the pecan colored. Uh, typical Ethiopian of the highlands, but then if you get into the lowlands, into the Sudan area, you see that blue-black of the Nubian, and I love that color. Uh, it's so deep and inviting, and, and so you'll see all sorts of variations there, and indeed there was much mingling. Any other questions? We've got another one. You mentioned that one drop of blood theory. Yes. As I've studied history, in the past, if someone white, excuse me, if someone black had someone, had one drop of white blood, for historical purposes, they were known to be white. And that's how history is able to eliminate blacks from. I believe that the rule, the one drop rule was unique to the United States of America, and it applied only to one group of people, black. If you were white and had one drop of Asian blood, it did not make you Asian. If you were white and had one drop of Jewish blood, it did not make you Jewish. But if you were white and had one drop of black blood, it did make you black. But it was again unique to the United States and it was put into effect during the time of slavery. And sadly, so often we see slave masters who impregnated their female slaves. And some of them would recognize and uh, um, claim the offspring of those unions, but in other cases they would not. And in almost all cases that I am aware of, those children remained in slavery because their mother was black and they had the one drop. Yes, ma'am. During World War II, if you had one drop of Jewish blood, you were terminated. In Nazi Germany? Yes. Not Interesting. So it was the, the same approach there. If you had one drop of Jewish blood in Nazi Germany, you were subject to going to the gas chambers. Interesting. I believe the lady in back of you had a question. So w when you're talking about the biblical people and mm -hmm. you have termed them as black, 
You're meaning that as a heritage, not necessarily as their skin color? Again, we'll have every variation of skin color possible. Um, if we look at those descendants of Africa in this audience, we have variations in skin color and uh, how dark or how light and in facial features. It's variations of any sort that we're talking about on the African continent. Yes. Science has shown that there are more racial differences within black than there are. There are more racial differences within the black race, well, well within black skin people, however you want to say it, than there are between black and white. We do have those variations, and my mother used to say to me, son, you can find among us, among our people, every shade that you could want. And, uh, you know, it's so true. There are those great variations. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. I hope this has been informative, but I hope more than anything that it piques your curiosity that uh, you uh, go to your scriptures. One of the things that I am sadly aware of, when I grew up, I grew up in a uh, faith called the Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal faith, and we did not have Sunday school manuals. We had the Word of God. We had the scriptures. And so even at a young age, we were taught directly from the scriptures. And we weren't reading the Cliff's Notes version. Uh, we were reading the scriptures. And I'm sad to say that today, a lot of times people aren't aware of the scriptures themselves. And they're accustomed to Sunday school uh, manuals and they're getting the Reader's Digest version of the scriptures. And they don't know the stories. They don't know about Tamar and Judah. And they don't know about uh, Abraham and uh, his handmaiden Hagar. I encourage you to read the scriptures, the Word of God, to get in them directly to find out for yourself what is in the scriptures and let your lives be edified. Now, for our next segment, we're going to take a break here and then we're going to have Marvin Perkins after our break presenting a, a piece on skin color. Again, thank you. Trying to find a loving way to tell the story 